I'm teaching this day on the subject more than conquerors more than conquerors Romans chapter 8 and verse 37 I want to show you in this service the principles that help an individual to walk in unquestionable dominion unquestionable dominion unquestionable dominion and so let me your attention be ready to listen learn and write let's start off with first timothy chapter 2 and verse 4 paul was speaking to his son in the gospel timothy and he had this to say he gave us a framework of the believers progression the bible says who desires all men i prefer kjv media if we can have kjv that's fine otherwise i'm still content who desires all men to be saved all men to be saved and then to come unto the knowledge of the truth so follow carefully paul is articulating god's desire for all men and he says in order of spiritual priority god desires all men someone shout all men Amen. that includes your relatives your family members your neighbor your colleagues in office he desires all men to be saved and then, like you have learned, in addition to that initial salvation experience, to come onto the knowledge of the truth. So it is possible that you are saved, like we learned during the conference. And I'll walk you through that illustration that I gave during the conference again. He desires that all men be saved. The moment you encounter the God of the Bible at salvation, it doesn't stop there. It doesn't stop there. It doesn't stop there. The Bible says there is a journey. So the initial salvation of um, the believer is not all there is to be experienced in Christ. In fact, that gives you the trigger for your journey. Are we together? So most believers get saved and then they stop there. But the Bible lets us know that that is the beginning of a journey that leads to victory, dominion, power, and grace. He desires that all men be saved and then to come unto the knowledge of the truth. Second scripture. John chapter 8 and verse 32. It's a scripture that has blessed me, it's changed my life, it's changed this ministry. The Bible says, and you shall know the truth, not hear the truth. It starts by hearing the truth. But the victory that is captured in truth is released not just upon hearing it. You must know the truth. It says, and ye shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. Make you free. That truth, if it's truth indeed, it sustains the ability to cause anyone, any family, any individual to walk in liberty. Are you ready for the third scripture? Scripture number three, 2 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 14. 2 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 14. We'll consider four scriptures and then I'll begin to teach. 2 Corinthians 2 and verse 14. Here's what it says. Now thanks be to God. Now thanks be to God who always leads us in triumph. Uh-huh in christ kjv says who causes us always to triumph and then he says and through us diffuses the fragrance of his knowledge this is powerful so when you spray a perfume you spray it from one point but it diffuses all over the room and so the bible says god causes us to triumph and the fragrance of our triumph in christ is spread abroad to everywhere and every person are we together so God wants people to know of his work in your life. He wants people to know of the victories and triumph that your life is experiencing in Christ. May that be your testimony. Amen. Shout a believing amen. amen. And then for a final scripture, Romans 8 and verse 37. More than conquerors, principles for unquestionable dominion. The Bible says nay or yet as nkjv says in all these things i like how the bible puts it 
in all these things. Now, when you read contextually, he began the preceding verses by saying, what then shall separate us from the love of Christ? And he begins to list a number of possibilities that can tamper with the believer's confidence. Famine, lack, etc. And then he says, yet or nay, in all these things. I like how he puts it. It lists all the possible obstacles that can befall a believer on your journey to manifesting the life and the power of Christ. He says persecution can have an impact upon your confidence, famine, hunger, and so on and so forth. But then he says, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through Christ who loved us. Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors. Very interesting scripture. It reveals two things from this scripture. Number one, that the believer can walk in dominion in spite of prevailing circumstances. I like the way Paul puts this. He does not ignore the factors that can tamper with your faith. He's honest enough to admit them and to articulate them. That famine, hunger, persecution. Are we together? Yes. So he does not ignore the fact that there are factors that sustain the ability to tamper with the believer's confidence, tamper with your joy, tamper with your peace, tamper with your sense of advancement. Hunger can have an effect on your faith. Famine, persecution, and so on and so forth. But he says, nay, yet in spite of all these things, we are more than conquerors. So he tells us that the obstacles are not the reason why the believer should remain a defeated life. He acknowledges the presence of these prevailing obstacles. Listen carefully, but he tells you that in spite of it, there is a possibility to exert dominion and to rise even above any and every prevalent circumstance. Are you learning already? But then the second thing he reveals from this scripture is he tells you God's strategy for administering victory and dominion through Christ. Through Christ. Nay, he says, or yet, we are more than conquerors, but he says through Christ. That means the believer's dominion is derived from your relationship with Christ. Outside of your partnership with Christ, there is no possibility for being a more than a conqueror and walking in dominion. Are you learning already? So that we do not have any capacity in ourselves to walk in the experience of dominion outside of our partnership with Christ. If you're following me so far, shout a loud believing amen. amen. A quick recap, during the conference, I taught you a four-step progression to becoming, to your evolving as a believer. And let me remind you again, number one, we said the journey of every man by default starts with that individual as an unsaved person. Are you still with me? Unsaved person. In iniquity did my mother conceive me. I hope you understand that the sin problem is beyond an act. It is a nature in man. A nature that was derived from the original sin. Are we together? Yes. And so all men are born in that nature of sin. But then an opportunity is given to all men in Christ. Listen so that you gain spiritual intelligence. Every believer who is methodically mentored should be able to guide other believers to help them know their journey per time, per season, as far as their faith work is concerned. So you can diagnose immediately at what level any believer is. So, an unsaved person, how do you become saved? You don't become saved by wishing. This is elementary, but you need to learn. How do you become saved? There is an exact formula for salvation. And if you do not engage that formula, you are not saved. The Bible says in Romans chapter 10 from verse 9 and 10, it says, For with the heart man believes unto righteousness. And it says, With the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Is the Greek word soteria. Liberty in its entirety. Are we together? Yes. 
with the heart man believes unto righteousness with the mouth confession is made unto salvation so when it has to do with receiving the life of god you must believe with your heart not everything about jesus translates to your salvation you must believe he is savior you must believe he is lord you must believe he is king are we together you must believe in his substitutionary sacrifice his substitutionary sacrifice believing jesus as savior is wonderful but what about the savior the savior that died are we together the savior that rose again on the third day according to scripture most believers are at a loss as to how unbelievers become believers coming to church does not make you saved it can be a platform for you to be saved but there is an exact information about Jesus you must believe with your heart and then verbalize it why verbalize it because God gave you a will and speaking is proof that you are using your will consciously so when you acknowledge the Lordship of Jesus Christ you receive of his life then according to scripture a translation happens please look up now that is a spiritual reality whilst that is happening you're probably in front of the altar or maybe in your room and you may not necessarily feel anything for other believers it could be a remarkable experience they may cry they may weep you know it comes with all kinds of impartations but generally speaking it's a spirit business so your mind may be unfruitful it may be as ordinary as any other experience however the bible says upon making that confession if true and sincere a translation happens say amen. amen a translation happens from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of his their son next phase you are now a believer however the bible tells us that a believer can be an infant is that true an infant in the spirit a babe in the spirit one who can only be fed with milk Paul expressed his frustration once and again that he visited certain cities he had come before he expected maturity from the believers but upon arriving there he found out that they were still babes they were still manifesting the feature of children so a believer can remain a child unfortunately growth in the spirit is not automatic it is engaged through light so you can be in church for 10 years you can grow biologically and yet remain a child spiritually and there are many indices to measure maturity and childishness one of it you find in first Corinthians chapter 13 when I was a child remember yeah I speak like a child I understood like a child so there are indices that show that a believer is a believer saved and yet an infant. Unfortunately, when you are an infant, Paul tells us that your results will differ not from one who is unsaved. An heir, he says, Galatians chapter 4, for as long as that heir is a child, he says he differeth not from a slave. That means the limitations of one who is outside Christ will largely be your limitation in spite of the fact that you are genuinely saved. Why? Because, listen now, the life we receive in Christ, the life we, re we, we receive in Christ, are the blessings that come with that life is released through knowledge did you get that the blessings that come with the zoe life is released through knowledge so here's my phone i would always give this instruction this is my phone and how many of you know that um i believe this is a good phone am i right talk to me americans all right so if you gave me a gift of this phone you gave me potential for efficiency am i right on that potential for efficiency this phone if used maximally can work wonders you can browse you can do a lot of things are we together but that you have this phone does not mean you will maximize the potentials that are wrapped up in this phone it depends on having a practical experiential knowledge on how to navigate your way through the phone did you know that I can receive this phone as a gift with all the potentials locked up in it and the only thing I'll do with this phone is to make a call. 
What am I doing? Underutilizing the potential. So someone meets me and I tell the person I've been struggling to send an email. And the person says, why? It should be so easy. With this kind of gadget, my ignorance is putting me at the same position as someone who does not even have a phone. This is the lot of many believers. So it is true that they are saved. And somehow, because of poor mentorship largely, they believe that just because you are in Christ now, automatically the riches of the God life will find expression in spite of what you know. Not so. Not so. Not so. This is why Paul laboriously visited the churches once and again and his assignment was to mature them. He says, my little children of whom I travail up until now, until Christ be formed in you. If you are learning so far, say amen. So an unsaved believer becomes a believer through the new birth experience, confessing the Lordship of Jesus. The next phase becomes the journey of transformation. So you are a believer, but you are an immature believer, void of knowledge, meaning void of authority, void of knowledge. Your life is only full of potentials, but the experience that comes with the God life cannot be captured in your life. Now, I told you during the conference that from the point of your being saved, now a believer, God introduces three factors to your life. And please lend me your attention. Number one, he introduces the person and the ministry of the Holy Spirit. There is such a thing as an encounter with the person, the office of the Holy Spirit. Even though he plays a role in your being saved, but there is a separate ministry. Jesus himself was with the disciples already. But he said, when the spirit of truth is come, in addition to me, he will come. And when he comes, he will guide you into all truth. Are we learning? So the Holy Spirit is introduced to your life officially. Number two, the word of God, scripture. Romans chapter 20 and verse 32. And that from a child... Thou hast known the Holy Scripture, which is able to build you up, are we together? And to give you an inheritance. Watch what Scripture does. It builds you up before delivering an inheritance. It doesn't deliver an inheritance. It builds you up and then it gives you an inheritance among them that are sanctified. Those who are sanctified are those who are already saved. But among them, not everybody is built up and not everybody can walk in the experience of their inheritance. Are we together? I commend you to God. I commend you to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up. John chapter 1 and verse 1 says, In the beginning, not from the beginning. In the beginning um, was the word and then he says the word was with God and then he says the word was God he says the same was with God in the beginning I like verse 3 he says all things were made by him and without him outside of the word was not anything made that was made all things were made by him the word are we together? And without the word, not anything, there was nothing made that was made. This is very powerful. Hebrews chapter 11, the Bible says, verse 1, Now faith is the substance of the things hoped for. It calls it the evidence of things not seen. Are we still together? The next verse says, For by it the elders obtained a good report. When you get to verse 3, it puts it beautifully. It says, Through faith we understand that the walls, the aeons were framed by the word of God. The walls were framed by the word of God. Framed by the word of God. So when a believer wants to transition, God introduces the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Number two, God introduces the word. These are the tools that sponsor transformation. Number three, God introduces that person to the ministry of a teaching priest. A teaching priest, a teaching priest, a teaching priest. Ephesians chapter 4, he led captivity captive and he gave gifts to men. Some apostles and prophets and evangelists and pastors and teachers. Why? For the equipping, the perfecting, the maturing of the saints for the work of the ministry. Are we together? 
that we be built until we become of the fullness of the measure of the stature of Christ, not tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine and the slight of men wherein they lie to deceive. Quoting from KJV. So my apologies if there are conflicts. It's already filed within my spirit. <laughs> Amen. Are we learning? Jeremiah chapter 3 and verse 15 says, And I will give you pastors. Please put it up for us. Jeremiah 3, 15. The value of a teaching priest. And I will give you pastors or shepherds according to my heart. Shepherds according to my heart. And the Bible says they will feed you. They will feed you. They will feed you with knowledge and they will feed you with understanding. Are you receiving knowledge now? Shout amen. Are you receiving understanding now? So it says, I will give you. Every man of God serving the Lord, loving God's people is a gift. I will give you pastors or shepherds according to my heart. And they will feed you with knowledge. They will feed you with understanding. So the unbeliever becomes the believer through the new birth experience. The believer becomes matured, transformed through this tripartite combination of the ministry of the Holy Spirit, the word of God. Are we together? Prayer becomes a platform to engage these tripartite forces. Without the word of God, without the Holy Spirit, without the ministry of the teaching priest, prayer does not carry any power on its own. The power that is in prayer is because of the word of God. Without the word of God, prayer becomes a ritual like any other idol practice. What gives power to prayer is its word compliancy. Are we learning now? That means for your prayer life to be effective, you must be sound in scripture. In order of priority, Jesus went to the temple before he went to pray. Because your prayer should be full of that which is written. That's what makes your prayer effectual. The fervent, effectual prayer. Don't even tempt me to go to the area of prayer because most believers say a lot of things and wrap it up in the name of Jesus and believe that they have prayed. Unfortunately, the prayer ministry has rules of engagement. There is such a thing as praying amiss. There is such a thing as being double-minded as you ask. And the Bible already tells you, let that man not think he will receive anything from the Lord. Then it says, this is the confidence that we have in him, that when we ask anything, anything, but according to his will, he heareth us. Your confidence is in the fact that your prayer is word compliant, scripture based, consistent with the will of God. And where the will of God is already written from scripture, you pray the scripture with confidence. But where the will of God is uniquely vague to you concerning a matter, you pray in the spirit until a clear revelation of God's will, which will be consistent from scripture, comes. One of the benefits of praying in the spirit is to help you download the mind of God per concern, per issue. Are we together? There's nowhere written in scripture that you should relocate, say, from Dallas to Virginia. It's not written here. What if that's what you want to do? You have to pray in the Spirit. And as you pray in the Spirit, the Holy Ghost has the unique ability to search the mind of God and to reveal to the saints that which is consistent with God's will. You're learning so far, say amen. amen. So when you get to the point of growth and maturity through transformation, I taught you, the next step becomes empowerment. And let me emphasize that the value of empowerment, the value of empowerment is that it comes upon a life that is transformed, a life that is matured, a life that is transformed, a life that is matured. And like you've heard me say, the oil will always reflect the size of the vessel carrying it. If the pot is small, the oil will look small. When she went to the prophet, the prophet said, no, the oil is not the issue. 
is the container. The vessel carrying the oil is small, and so it makes the oil look small. It says, go and borrow vessels. Expand your capacity. Grow in the spirit. Borrow not a few. And the Bible says, as soon as she started expanding, the oil grew to match the vessels. And when there was no more vessel, the oil stopped. Now, I told you that once you become empowered by the Spirit, your name changes. It doesn't mean you are not a believer. You are still a believer, but there is an increase, an elevation, an upgrade in the Spirit. Okay? So the believer now transforms to be a witness. It is at the point of being a witness God can send you. He can send you to stand to defend His purposes doesn't matter whether in ministry as we know it or in business or in family career now you are beyond just a believer you are beyond just an infant you are beyond transformed you are beyond empowered he can send you and back you it is at that point you become truly useful to God's program if you followed everything shout amen, amen. right now but my concern this um, at this service is not just to serve the purposes of God, but I want to teach you that God wants you to live a victorious life whilst you serve him. Did you get that? God does not just want you to serve him living a defeated life. There are many believers who are serving the Lord sincerely, serving in church, living for Jesus, standing for Jesus, but the victory that is in Christ is hardly seen in their lives. This is my assignment, to show you that it is possible to serve God whilst manifesting unquestionable dominion. Unquestionable dominion unquestionable dominion that looks like a prophetic word for someone unquestionable dominion dominion in your relationships dominion in your finances dominion over your body are we together and there are principles so are you ready to learn mm. thank you Jesus blessed be the name of the Lord John chapter 15 and verse 8 most believers do not know why God insists that their lives bear fruit. Please look up. If you do not understand the intent behind God's insistence for your fruitfulness, you may not partner with him in making that happen. So we have several believers who the issue of fruitfulness and advancement and progress for many of them uh, they, they don't give it the passion and the aggression enough because they do not know that there is a dimension of God's glory that cannot be revealed until you bear fruits did you get that there is a dimension of the glory of God that cannot be revealed until you bear fruit So John chapter 15 and verse 8 says, Herein is my Father glorified. Herein is my Father glorified. By this is my Father glorified. It says, When you bear much fruit, so shall you be my disciples. KJV would tell us, Here is my, Herein is my Father glorified. When you bear much fruit. That means when you produce results. Please look at me. Spiritual results. Financial results. When you make progress spiritually. When you advance in life and destiny and in the spirit. God is glorified. God is glorified. Did you get that? That means when you live a life void of sickness. Void of um, um, all of these bodily infirmities, God is glorified. Say amen. amen. When you're not behind on your finances and you're making progress enough to take care of your family and the kingdom, God is glorified. Say amen. amen. When you have quality relationships, your spouse, your children, and things are working relationally, God is glorified. When you are growing in your mind and scaling heights, even in your professional career, are we together? God is glorified. Someone shout be glorified. be glorified. One more time, say be glorified. be glorified. So it's important for you to know that God's glory, the revelation of God's glory upon the earth depends on the results produced by and from and through the saints. The, the glorification of the Christ upon the earth depends on the results that we produce. If we refuse to produce results, it will look like God lied. 
our results bring validations to his claims. Ah, so he's glorified when I produce results, extraordinary results. He is glorified when I walk in dominion. He is glorified when I scale heights in business, I scale heights in ministry. That means if you were Satan, how would you stop the saints from bringing glory to God? By attacking their potential for productivity. Attacking their potential, it can be through, uh, by plaguing their health, by destroying their mind. You see the reason why we pray over the sick is beyond showing that a man is anointed. We are remedying something Satan is doing to God's creation.